Hi, welcome and thank you for joining us at Rolling Hills Library in St. Joseph. My name is Anali and I'm a public services librarian. We are very happy to have a, um, a women's history program actually today and very much a community engagement program. We're very happy to have Chelsea Howlett with us, who is the executive director of the Noise Home, and also Gretchen Herndon, who is the Ladies Union Benevolent Association um, board president and also has had leadership at Noise Home. So we'll welcome hearing from both of you. Um, Chelsea, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen with us, we are very pleased to have you here. Thank you for taking the time and the energy to put this together, and we look forward to learning about Noise Home and about Luba. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for having us. I'm delighted to have Gretchen here with us. Um, she actually hired me at Noise Home back in 2011 when I started there. Um, I have been with, with Noise Home for almost a decade um, and as executive director for the last four years. So um, my educational background, I want to give a quick shout out as Go Griffs because I went to Missouri Western, um, double majored art therapy, pardon me, art and um, pre-med, ended up going to graduate school for art therapy. So my master's degree is in art therapy and counseling. Gretchen, would you like to give your educational background and any additional? Uh, yes. I too am a Mo West uh, graduate and uh, I too was very well prepared for graduate school. I went to UMKC. My bachelor's degree is in psychology and my master's is in counseling as well. Excellent. Well, many times when I give presentations, people want to know more about Noise Home. And I ask, is it okay if I begin the, the topic more about Luba? Because without Luba, there wouldn't be a Noise Home. And so that's where we will start today. Um, most people are not familiar with that. So I'd like just to ask um, the people who are here, have any of you heard of Luba before? Is that an acronym that you're familiar with? Excellent. Okay, so it does stand for Ladies Union Benevolent Association. It began, this is not the first group of ladies, but it is the best picture that I can find um, that is older. It started way back in 1872 with a church Bible study group. Um, they came together, they knew that there was a lot of need in the community, um, given that you know, we were a border war state during Civil War times. Um, there were a significant number of widows as well as orphans. Um, that and also orphan trains moved through this area with children um, being selected to go to work on farms. And some of those children ran away. So there was a significant number of children who were called little wanderers in our community. So as that Bible study grew in attendance, um, they decided they wanted to do more than simply read the word of God. They wanted to live it. So they ended up having tea parties, um, sold baked goods, similar to how, you know, we might as a grassroots movement try to get um, an initiative going as well. They were not able to vote at that time period, nor hold wealth. So the fact that this group of women was able to accomplish what they did is incredibly phenomenal at that time. They incorporated in 1874. Um, so they've been together, or been in existence, pardon me, in our community for 147 years. Um, we're excited, you know, three years from now, we'll be having a huge celebration in honor of 150 years of Luba. Um, attend, pardon me, um, Admission into the LUBA board is by invitation, and we currently have around 18 members. We can have a maximum of 28 members, but it has always been exclusively men. Now, you do see that there's two gentlemen in this picture here. Those likely were trustees, um, but in recent years, that has moved, and I say recent, within like the 50s, 60s, it moved to being um, female members of the board who are trustees as well. So they, they started their mission by renting a small A-frame home, not this one that's pictured, but um, one that was at the corner of, um, let's see, De Dewey and Antoine in the North End. They named it the Home for the Friendless. Not a very PC name by our standards today, by any means, but it was descriptive. And they took in man, woman, or child, regardless of you know their marital status, their religious status, they just wanted to help people. Um, but unfortunately, the stigma that oftentimes associates homelessness now, um, was prevalent then as well. The neighboring homes were not fond of having a, 
a transitory um, home, essentially, there, where people were moving in and out um, frequently. So they lost the lease multiple times to rental homes that they had secured and ended up realizing they needed to have a permanent location. So they purchased the old Beatty Farm, which is, is in this photo here, and they named it Memorial Home and continued to serve children, women, um, families, and men if needed. Um, the majority of the individuals that they served were mothers with children or independent children and those that had maybe some um, lesser mental health issues that didn't qualify for placement in the asylum or developmental needs. That particular home, Memorial Home, remained in existence until the 1990s. Um, it's actually at the corner of Maine and Poolin in the North End, if any of you are interested in going for a little bit of a drive. Now, the earlier intersection that I told you about is no longer in existence. Um, you would have to um, go and look at the 220 the I-29, pardon me, no, the 229 overpass. It's a green area. We did go and try to locate it because I was so excited at the prospect of standing in the middle of that intersection and spanning around and looking at all the different houses and, you know, kind of dreaming about what it, what is, what it was like way back in the um, 1880s when it all began. So this memorial home ended up becoming a modern version in the form of Meadowview, which most people are not familiar with, but it is located out near the hospital at Murphy Watson Burr. We continued that mission. Um, once Noise Home was established, um, there was a continued need for that, that service. Um, so we have a 16 room private facility there for low-income seniors that we provide benevolence to. Um, they are essentially independent living individuals, not in need of assisted living or um, higher level of care. But most people are not familiar with, with that particular mission that we have. Um, we continue to honor serving the seniors in that capacity. Now, enter Noise Home. So many people, they are familiar with Noise Home, they're familiar with maybe even our our legal name, which is Home for Little Wanderers, but they aren't necessarily familiar with how it all came to be. And it was thanks to Charles and Sarepta Noyes, and I have photos of them in a moment, but I think it's important to note that Charles Noyes, while he never wanted any kind of attention or accolades in his lifetime, um, really came full circle when he opened or assisted Lupa in opening Noyes Home. He himself was an orphan. Now, by modern day standards, he absolutely was an orphan. Both of his parents died at age by the age of 15. Um, now, by standards back then, he was practically an adult. He lived on the East Coast and ended up moving to White Cloud, Kansas to live with a bachelor uncle who ran the Bailey and Noise Dry Goods Store. It was um, told in uh, several accounts that I've found in our, our history books that he um, was quite the businessman, even at age, you know, 15, 16, 17, learned the family business and by age 18 ended up purchasing the family business from his uncle and not long after expanded into the Kansas City and St. Joseph areas. Um, ended up settling in St. Joseph pardon me, St. Joseph, and refined his company into a shoe company. He actually manufactured shoes and had a storeroom as well. He became incredibly wealthy this way. Um, the dry goods business was helpful because of Western expansion, but then as he you know, really honed this in, um, he became a millionaire by um, today's standards and ended up really having quite the heart for benevolence and giving back to the community. Um, now, if you've lived in St. Joseph for any length of time, you're familiar with noise as a name. Um, this actually is, an, I love old pictures, so I'm a little heavy in, in pictures that I found from here. These are individuals who worked at um, the noise um, shoe factory or the showroom. This here is Charles Noise right here. Um, and then his business partner was Mr. Norman. Um, if you're at all interested in driving around and, and looking at sites, here's another one you can see in St. Joseph. This is actually the Noise um, Norman Shoe Manufacturing Factory, as well as showroom. Now, it did have um, a couple of fires over the course of several years um, and was damaged at one point where they did have to shut it down. But what I think is phenomenal um, to learn more about this, this particular family, Mr. Noise and Mrs. Noise, Charles and Sarepta had all the wealth in, you know, the big time St. Joseph era where they they could have had a beautiful home that rivaled any Victorian um, that you could see in, in St. Joseph, but they chose to live in an apartment above their factory rather than spend money on, um, you know, the frivolous things is how they viewed it. Now, when they retired, they did end up 
moving to California, he was an avid bird hunter um, and wanted to be able to retire and enjoy that. But there was a lot of tragedy also that came along, not only with their business having those two fires where um, one of their workers did perish, but also they lost their children. They had four children. Um, their names were Tyrene, Sarah, Susan, and Newton. Um, they all have passed away um, very early. The oldest one um, to make it into adulthood was featured here as Tyrene. She died in her early 20s, shortly after getting married, but the others were in infancy and toddler years. So Mr. and Mrs. Noyes knew a lot about loss and grief, and I believe very much that Noyes Home um, became a monument to their children, you know, to let their children's memories live on. However, they never wanted the name Noyes attached to it, and it actually took three different visits to the, the board president at that time um, before they were able to fully grasp um, the gift that Mr. and Mrs. Noyes were wanting to give. He approached them and said, I will purchase the land and I will build you a building so that there can be a separate home for children. Um, he and his wife, his wife was actually a member of the Luba board, um, would go to Memorial Home. Our, our, I should say, our board members are incredibly active, but if you scanned back to um, the 1880s, 90s, when this all first was starting, they were doing all of the hands-on work. They were cooking and cleaning and making sure that all of the needs of those individuals that were cared for there were provided for. So Mr. Noyes would frequently go to Memorial Home with his wife and would note how many children were there unaccompanied. And as an orphan, I believe as an orphan, in his heart, he knew that that just wasn't necessarily the best place for them and wanted to have a separate children's home. So after several meetings, it was agreed upon that Luba would run Noise Home, pardon me, Home for Little Wanderers. It didn't become Noise Home until after his death. Um, and they would oversee that. He would provide a trust. Um, and it was rumored that after it was built, he actually would come through on an, a yearly or, or multiple times throughout the year and make a list of all the repairs and would write a check and then leave. Um, it was just amazing the amount of generosity that this family showed to make this possible. Um, early records indicate that it was his money alone that kept Noise Home um, afloat. Um, now, by today's standards, and we'll talk about this, this later, um, our budget is incredibly large for what we, we do. I mean, it has to be in order to provide for care 24 hours a day for children. Um, but we are entirely privately funded. And I think that's important for people to realize that it's our community, starting with Mr. and Mrs. Noyes, that made this possible. So this is the home um, in an early architectural drawing, what it was proposed to look like. They looked at several sites throughout St. Joseph and selected the one that we currently are at and will remain at hopefully indefinitely on 28th, um, 28th Street. It was not known as Noise Boulevard at that time um, because the boulevard system had not been installed yet. Um, there are eight acres that we have. Um, this home really, we have kept it the exterior intact. We have not done any kind of major renovations um, to the exterior. Now we've done major renovations um, and updating on the inside to meet modern needs. Um, but as you see it here really is very much what it looks like with the exception in our capital campaign, we did add an, a nice new entrance um, that was much needed. I think this is also interesting. Like I said, I love finding old documents and we're in the process of actually creating a hallway historical um, installation. When you first walk into Noise Home, if you've been inside, you look to the right, there's a long hallway. We're wanting to show our showcase our history there. Um, so as you would walk in, pardon me, right here, it would be this corridor here. Pardon me, that's not correct. It's this one here. Um, I show this because as we talk about the capital um, campaign that happened, I think it's kind of interesting that the spaces that we chose to renovate um, ended up coming full circle as well. This was what was known as the hospital. And back in the early days when they had children, infants and toddlers that were brought to Noise Home, it was not uncommon for them to be placed in the community with a group, um, a group of volunteers who were willing to care for those children. Because as we know, infants and toddlers take a lot more one-on-one -on -one care than say a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, um, et cetera. So when we would first get placements, they were placed in the hospital, which seems kind of counterintuitive 
intuitive. You know, you wouldn't want to put babies in with sick children. I wouldn't anyway. Um, but we found pictures when we were getting ready to renovate to make this the nursery. This little alcove area here has windows and you can see out um, the south view towards Moila. We found pictures of children um, looking out those windows and we were able to piece together the history and see that that was in fact where um, the younger kids were were housed. Um, and we liked the fact that we were able to make that again a reality. Um, so when we talk about renovations in, the, in um, a little while here, this is where the nursery is. Our pre-K area is here. Upstairs is where our boys and our girls dormitory are located. And once COVID is over, and, and it does say nursery here, they utilize these actually for um, early on, it may have been nursery, but this is where the majority of the time they were housed. This ended up becoming um, visiting spaces and um, eventually this became the sick room as well. So we utilize the space that we have and we, we make um, adjustments as needed. We've always had to, um, to do that because we can never predict exactly how many children or what ages we'll have at any given time. Um, these, this is an actually old photo. You can see the children laying there, sitting out in the lawn. Um, again, just some really sweet images. We do still have a library. Ours looks quite a bit different now, um, but you'll find if you ever tour the noise home that um, the tables that you see in this picture and the dining room picture, we still have um, in use at least one of them in our home. So we try to pay um, an honor, I should say, honor our, our history as much as we possibly can. Um, Gretchen, is there anything that you want to add to the historical piece? No, I just kind of, uh, I think the piece that I thought was important was that the women that were Luba and, and were a part of all of this could not vote. Um, and for a period of time, they could not own property. And I, I just found that uh, very interesting and impressive that that didn't seem to stop them. They just knew what they wanted to do and they got it done. I, I was, I've always been impressed by that. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that it is phenomenal that women who were essentially deprived of so much and so reliant upon um, their male family members were able to make this happen. Um, and I also think it's phenomenal that we continue to have it be a female-led um, mission here in town. Now, the upstairs dormitory does not look anything like this currently. However, when I started in 2011, um, other than having bunk beds, it looked very similar to this. We had big open bays um, rather than um, double occupancy rooms as we do now. Um, I wish that I could say that our rooms always looked this neat and tidy, um, but we have kids that live there. We do our best to teach them chores and how to take care of a home. Um, but if you come on a tour, you'll have to give us a little bit of grace because it probably won't look quite like that. Um, one last thing to speak about with Charles and, and Sarepta. When Charles died, it was his goal, and he actually made this known publicly, that he wished to die as penniless as those that he helped. So in addition to the Home for Little Wanderers, he left um, in his estate monies to be able to build a state-of-the-art hospital known as the Noise Hospital. Has anyone ever heard of the Noise Hospital or been familiar with it? Okay, so there's a, oh, pardon me. I am jumping ahead of myself. Noise became a name known very well in town because of course the Noise Elementary School, Noise Boulevard, and the Noise Pool. But what a lot of people do not know about is the Noise Hospital. It's actually now known as Frederick Towers, but it was cutting edge technology that they um, had. These were solariums. This was back when, gosh, who would have thought fresh air would be helpful when you're sick, right? Um, but he really wanted it to be as cutting edge as possible, but also make sure that no matter your ability to pay, you received services. So the trust that he set up, a portion went to Noise Home and a portion went to this hospital. Um, and I, I want to learn more about the, the hospital and, and obviously at some point it did close. I haven't spent as much time um, learning about that, but I just think that, you know, as you're driving downtown, um, you know, take a look and remember that that was thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Noise. So here is the boulevard system. They actually, our large bank that we have that unfortunately causes a lot of headaches for us with mowing and not being able to get grass to mow there. It's mostly weeds. Um, that developed, I'm sure, because of the boulevard system when it all got cut through. We're hoping in the near future, I have 
plans anyway, to be able to put a retaining wall and to have flowers that the, kill, the children can help plant and, and tend. Um, but we'll see, that, that's a large project and not one that is a priority at this point. Um, but this is an early portrait of the Boulevard system. This was taken in the 40s when we were celebrating one of our anniversaries. And I love this picture because we tried to recreate it in, the, in um, oh goodness, it would have been in, I believe 2013, um, or maybe it was 2014, when we had our 120 years. Um, and the little boy that hears that, the recreation of it. Um, anyway, I'll go back up to the slide that I skipped over. So the capital campaign was really the first time we'd ever publicly asked for money. And it wasn't until 2011. Um, and I know that the planning process started much before that. And it, it all stemmed from a national research study that looked at child abuse and neglect rates for the zero to five population. And what they found, it was a national study, but what they found was that Northwest Missouri ranked as one of the highest areas um, of child abuse. And unfortunately, infant and toddler mortality um, at the hands of caregivers. And our community formed a task force shortly after those results came out and said, you know, this isn't something that we wanna be known for. We need to do something to make um, an impact in this. They were looking at different agencies, different services that exist existed currently at that time that could possibly expand and absorb that population and Noise Home was on that list. So they came to Noise Home and spoke with Luba about expanding and, and I want to believe that their first reaction was yes absolutely we want to do this but we also knew the expense that it would take. Having a home that was built in 1894 um, was not ADA compliant. That was going to be the very first thing that we had to do. We needed to update spaces so that it was safe. We are a state licensed facility, even though we don't receive um, state and federal funding. And I do need to say there's a tiny asterisk to that statement. We don't receive major grants and, and funding in that way. We do receive payments for foster care children, and we can accept foster care children because we are state licensed. And those state licensing guys pardon me, guidelines give us best practice to be able to ensure that we're providing the very best possible care to the kids that we have, um, up-to-date training and, and ensuring that our spaces are safe and our practices are, are to the standards that they need to be. Um, so with that being said, we, we needed to figure out how we could fund such a large undertaking to renovate a space to make um, an area that the nursery could, could work and thrive and have safe egress in the event that we had a fire for a crib. Um, and then also we knew that it was important that we remodeled our upstairs because really since it opened, there were small remodeling projects that took place painting, new furnishings, those types of things, but never really looking at the spaces and identifying if those original designs really met the children's needs. So I, I was hired August um, of 2011, and I remember giving tours early on where I hate to admit this, but I was embarrassed sometimes um, by taking them up to the boys' dorm in particular. We know boys. I have four boys. I know boys are hard on things. I get it. But when you walked in, um, the carpeting was torn in places. The restroom, there was one restroom um, for all of the boys. And sometimes we had 20 plus boys in that space. Um, I say it a little tongue in cheek, but I mean it. No amount of bleach could get that smell out of there. You know, we, we kept it clean, but you know, boys can be smelly. Um, and they only had one bathroom where there were two sinks, two toilets, two urinals, and I believe two or maybe three showers. I can't recall now. Um, and that's where all of the kids were going in and out. There wasn't the privacy necessarily um, that would be appropriate for kids. Also having five-year-olds and 18-year-olds in and out of the same bathroom, I didn't feel comfortable with that. Um, you would walk in, the restroom was on the left-hand side, there was a community space here, and then there were two big open bays, one on the right and one on the left. The one on the right was for the older boys, and it had bunk beds, and it had, um, it had closets, and it had dresser drawers, but it didn't necessarily feel like home. It felt like a military barracks or maybe what you might think of as a stereotypical orphanage style setup, um, but it did not feel like home. And the board saw that. They recognized that it needed 
to be updated and they decided to go with a model that allowed for double occupancy rooms which truly made all the difference the kids take so much more pride in their space now when it was big open bays especially with the younger boys Gretchen can attest to this I would spend a lot of time up there saying okay we have to clean this up and this is how it looks and I would have boys like I'm not cleaning you know granted our kids oftentimes do come from environments where that hasn't been taught or modeled um, and we think it's really important that we instill how to take care of oneself and how to take care of one's belongings um, but I remember I had one little boy who looked at me flat out and he's like if he's not going to clean I'm not going to clean and I thought oh yeah that that is a challenge you know when you have 10 kids and then pretty soon you have 10 kids all saying they're not going to clean and who's going to be cleaning um, so ultimately this change was very very much for the better for our, our older kids. Um, we have some pictures coming up of them moving in during that time period. But I do wanna talk a little bit more about our capital campaign. Like I said, it was the very first time we had ever really gone public and said we needed funds. We had always had the support of the community, but on a very quiet level. We had our needs met, but never really more than that. We continue and we still have our trust that started way back when Mr. and Mrs. Noyes established the Home for Little Wanderers. But that is a small drop in the bucket when you look at what our costs are to, to really do what we um, do each day at Noise Home. So I, I shared with you the various things that we needed to accomplish. Our goal was 2.25 um, million dollars. So we actually raised more. And it was during a time when there were additional capital, pardon me, capital campaigns going on in our community. And it was pretty phenomenal that our community stepped up and, and raised this amount of money in record time. So those renovations began in spring of 2012 and concluded in December of 2013. Our very first nursery, um, occup pardon me, nursery resident came in on October 31st of 2012. I'll never forget that day or that little man who stole our hearts and ended up spending some time with us um, off and on throughout a lot of his early years. This is a picture of the remodeled nursery. And I would love to invite each of you to come through on a, a tour once we can. Um, COVID has made it impossible for us to function in many of the ways that we are used to. And that's, that's one thing that we have not been able to do is tours to keep exposures down. Um, but this is the nursery space. What you don't see is on this side, um, at least I don't see it because that's where everybody's pictures are, are the, um, the cribs that the children sleep in. Modern day, this looks a little bit differently because we were pretty naive, I think, when we were planning. We knew that there was a need in our community, but we didn't just really have a, a good grasp for how great the need was. We anticipated that having four beds in the nursery to, to house children zero to two and four beds in our pre-K room um, to house three to five-year-olds and then an overflow area upstairs in the event that we got more than those eight children in the, that age range. It's important to note children over the age of three can sleep upstairs, but then under the age of three must sleep in the nursery for safe egress purposes. Um, I say we're naive because that first summer that we were open, um, we ended up having 24 children under the age of five. And no time was it more evident of how great the need was than when you would walk into the dining hall um, for, for meal times, and you would see all of these little faces lined up, you know, at their table, um, in their booster seats or in their high chairs, just waiting to get their, their food. Um, and I am so grateful that the community stepped up because we have, share, we have been able to I'm sure in some cases saved children's lives, but certainly been able to, to help build up the support system that our families and our community needed um, that they didn't have. That zero to five population is such a vulnerable one in that they don't go to school necessarily, even preschools, so they don't have those those extra eyes of the teachers, making sure that they're getting fed and that they're growing and developing the way that they need. And a lot of times the families that we serve, not always, but a lot of times they are young parents who are truly doing the very best that they know how to do. And likely when we learn their story, you know, we, we have nothing but love and, and compassion for them at that point because what they are doing for their children is likely what was done for them. And it may have been, you know, the best that their parents could do, but we, we want them to know that there are services available in our community and we're one of them that want to help them um, do the very best that they can for their kids and if they're in a crisis situation of homelessness or drug addiction or mental health crises or even medical um, emergencies that we are here to assist. This is a, a picture of the preschool room when it was um, newly remodeled. Um, it's amazing to me that you know we will goodness it'll be 10 years next year that it's been opened so some of these faces 
when I see them out in the community, I'm like, it's impossible that you're that big already. Um, this is a picture of the boys dormitory. This is the door as you would be facing in. So this would be the little boys dorm hallway. It was important to us to create age appropriate playrooms as well so that when they were up in the dorms, our little boys could go into an area that would have toys and books and entertainment that's appropriate for them. And our older boys would have hangout space where the pesky little kids weren't, you know, right on top of them all the time. Um, so our older boys hangout area is here. Our little boys is here. And then this shows you just the double occupancy rooms. This is a finished room. Um, again, this is the boys dormitory. So many times people will say, gosh, you know, I'm, when they go on a tour, they're impressed by how clean the boys' dorm is and how much larger the girls' dormitory is. Um, and really, that goes back to historically, too. We, we tend to have more older girls and more younger boys. Um, we also used to have house parents. So part of the girls' dormitory was originally intended to be an apartment where a family would live, and they would help take care of all of the children of Noy's home. That was their job. Um, this is the move-in day for one of our little ladies. Um, I remember the joy that they had, the, the excitement. Um, there was one situation that occurred not long after move-in day with the, the remodel um, where a family of three came in and there was a six-month-old who um, had the worst diaper rash I've ever seen. She sat in her car seat and I'm sure just soiled herself for hours. Um, and again, it was a young mom. We, we learned a lot and had a lot more compassion for her once we learned the story, but I remember being viscerally angry, and I'm usually a pretty calm person. I needed to let my staff handle that situation because I thought, how could you let a little, a little one sit like that and, and get such pain um, and infection? And so I took her older siblings. Um, the older girl's name was Faith, and I thought that was really um, serendipitous because she, she had spunk and she did have faith that this was life was going to be better for her. Um, we, I took her and her brother and we went on a tour of the house. Um, we ended up, I, she quickly told me that she hadn't eaten for a while. So we went and we made some grilled cheese and tomato soup. And so after a while, they, they ate so much. The little boy, I thought he was going to eat himself sick. So I said, let's, let's take a pause and let's go upstairs. We toured the main floor and the lower level. We went upstairs and I was showing them the rooms and I said, Faith, you can choose um, a room um, that you want. And I gave her the option of a couple and she looked at me and her eyes got big like saucers. She's like, wait a minute, I get my own bed? And I said, of course. And she goes, and it was a comforter similar to this. That's what jogged my memory. She ran her hand along it and she's like, this is such a pretty quilt. Can I sleep on it? And I said, sweetie, you can sleep in that bed, of course. And she goes, can I sleep under it? And that's when my, my heart just about fell out. I said, of course you can sleep under it, honey. How would you keep warm? And she said, well, I was always too dirty at the places that I stayed. They wouldn't let me sleep under the under their blankets. I only could sleep on top of them. Um, and I just thought, you know, that's, that was a wake up call for me. I, I certainly had um, a very blessed existence, um, you know, a blessed childhood. And, and I, I think it's important to share the stories of that, you know, something as simple as a blanket, and then to be able to have her own room. I remember her getting so excited about her fluffy stuffies that she got from the noise home store that she was able to put in different places and decorate her room. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to say that she, she and her mom were able to learn a lot about how to take care of each other, but also how to take care of themselves. Um, she is with family and I love getting updates because so often, you know, these kids, they come in and they burrow a special place in your heart. And then after a while, they, they have to, you know, go back with their family. That's, that's our whole hope is healing hearts and reconnecting families. And I am so sorry. Gretchen, can you take over for just a moment? Because my own little one needs my attention. I'm sorry. Yeah. Is this going to continue rolling the pictures? Um, I can move them if you'd like. But if you want to talk no, no, a little no. bit about... If, if the... it's doing it automatically, that, that's fine. Well, if you want to talk, because you were executive director during the capital campaign. Yes, yes. And um, my office was where the pre-K pre children are now. And my previous job was with Head Start. And I was there for a very long time. And I was the only person that ha <clears throat> excuse me, had a door to my office because I was the director. And that <laughs> I got to have a door. And uh, I was in this very, very nice big room that ha we had a meeting room and there was a full bath in it. And so 
at one time, somebody actually lived there that was employed there. And I said, I don't need all of the space. And that was when they decided they could use that for the pre-K room. And so some of the two-year-olds, the, the kids that couldn't go upstairs could be in that room. And uh, you saw two beds there, but we have trundle beds under the, those beds, so we can have four in that room. Um, it, it was it was an exciting adventure during that whole piece of time because, with my Head Start experience, we serve zero uh, pregnant women to age five. You know everything prior to uh, kindergarten, and um, I had a knowledge of licensing and those kinds of things. And I didn't have the knowledge of uh, anything beyond pre-K. So it, that was pretty exciting. But for the, the older kids to have space and, and for them to express their needs, there were a lot of similarities with them and the, child, the little ones because of family ties, et cetera. And uh, they, they really did appreciate what was what was offered to them and there was a routine that I think spoke well of noise home and the other thing is scholarship a lot of kids did not have habits developed to study to do their homework um, to do chores the high schoolers do their own laundry uh, and they have a day signed. Uh, there's kitchen cleanup for the ones that can be in the kitchen. Uh, and th those are shared chores. But I, I was always impressed that we have a wall of uh, gratitude, not gratitude, but a, a wall of, oh, I can't remember what we call it. But um, if somebody had perfect attendance, if somebody was on the principal's list for good grades, counselors, it was wonderful. Uh, we also had counselors uh, and teachers uh, eat meals with. So that that was my first impression when I started. I filled in. Uh, Judy Fuston, if you know her, called me and asked me if I was sitting down. They needed a, a an executive director to fill in. And um, I accepted and I asked if I could after a few months I asked if I could stay longer and uh, I was there for the transition with the adding on of the uh, nursery and preschool and I got to hire Chelsea that was my greatest uh, reward. Well you're very kind to say that thank you Gretchen. Sure. Um, so we, we did we went through a huge transition and really um, amazing metamorphosis when it came to who we were serving because we now could serve the zero to five population whereas when I first began as exact pardon me as program director I remember going to, to Gretchen and saying so I have a family on the phone who has three kids there's a three-year-old there's a 10-year-old and there's a 12-year-old and I had to go back and talk to that family and say I can serve your 10 and your 12-year-old but I'm sorry we're not licensed to take your three-year-old and I felt horrible doing that because I was putting that parent in an, an unimaginable position to choose, am I going to separate my kids? You know, am I going to be able to place my older kids and somehow find something for my younger child? Um, so the first year that we were open, once we had the nursery and the pre-K fully open, renovations were completed, we saw a huge increase in our referrals. Um, we had 399 that year. We served 162 kids. Um, which was up by a, a good 50 kids from the year prior. Um, and I think this is really interesting. There were 53 children under the age of five over the course of that year. Um, I included several years worth of statistics here. So just, you know, kind of look at them and, and I'll call attention to the ones that I think are notable. Um, when I first started working at Noise Home, the average length of stay was about 90 days um, throughout that year for a child. Now by history, Noise Home was known as a place that children could grow up at. Um, now as we became more modern and realized that was not what was best for that child, we still have some teenagers who will enter into our program maybe at age 16 and stay with us until they, they age out. But the years long, um, you know, where kids are with us for five years, 10 years is very, very uncommon. Um, the average daily census did go up to 39 children. And I remember when I first started with um, Gretchen as my executive director, we had um, maybe 15 kids 
total. Um, you know, and most of those were teenagers. We did become more selective with our admissions process um, because some of those teenagers that we served at that time were kids that had more violence or maybe um, aggression as well as some mental health issues where they weren't necessarily the safest to be around others. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were taking on the, the children that we could care for and provide what they needed and not put any of our younger children that we were now accepting in harm's way. So look at that number jump. In 2017, that was our highest year for number of referrals. Um, we do receive referrals from all over the state of Missouri, but most of them, usually about three quarters of them come from Buchanan County and Andrew County. So we did serve 291 kids that year. Um, something new that we started tracking that year was how many families we impacted, and that was 127. Um, again, you see that we had an incredibly high number of children under the age of five that we served. And I think this is also very telling. Our average age went from 10, 12, down to seven years old. Uh, we did cut the average length of stay down to 39, um, but we continued to have a pretty stable number of kids. Typically, we have about 30, um, 34 to 35 kids any given year. Uh, this is our most recent stats. We're getting ready to release our 2021s soon, um, but we saw a decline in 2019, and that was largely due to um, at our economy and our job market was really good. Our families that we were helping that were struggling with homelessness or struggling with um, unemployment were able to get jobs and get reestablished pretty quickly. Then 2020 hit and presented all sorts of new challenges for us. Um, our census is actually lower than what um, it has been in the past. And I think there's many layers to that, one of which is Many of our kids in our community are not going to school um, in the traditional sense. You know, they've been schooling from home. And I am certain, and I hate to say this because it makes me just feel sick to my stomach, that there are kids out there who need us, but who are not with us because the teachers, the counselors, they don't have their eyes on them to say, you really, you know, you really need some assistance and let's, let's get children's division involved. We have a good majority of our kids that are referred to us as um, a oh, an option so that the children do not have to go into care, but as a voluntary placement. Um, and it takes that threat of having their children removed from their custody, but rather they're working with us and working with Children's Division to be able to provide the safest environment for their, their child. Um, and they do have accountability to us as well as Children's Division. You know, we very much have a wraparound approach. We want everybody on the same page so there isn't triangulation. Um, this, I think, oh goodness, I put this over here. I'm, if your little um, pictures are on the right-hand side, you may wanna move them over, but I will do my best to share with you. In 2019, the vast majority, and this is year after year, the kids that we serve are homeless. 58% of them were homeless. Um, foster care ended up, our biggest year that we've had in my time there um, was foster care in 2019, where we had 23% of our kids, almost a quarter of our kids were in foster care. Um, and then what often will happen, they may go into care um, and stay in foster care for about 30 days. If the family has made adequate progress, then the children are no longer in care, but our work, they have, um, the opportunity to stay at Noise Home and we help them transition the children home. So in some ways, we're also providing a service to the state of Missouri in reducing the, their costs um, by taking in these, these families and helping them rebuild. Respite is a program that a lot of people are not familiar with when they first see it written down. And it's a, a pretty significant number of the kids that we serve each year. It really started, um, or I should say grew, with the um, expansion of the nursery and pre-K. We did have respite before. It looked a lot different. It was for a weekend. If families were maybe kind of at their wits end with a child behaviorally and they needed a break, they could bring the child and have a weekend at Noy's home um, or an extended weekend, um, maybe even a week during the summer. So that, and unfortunately, I think a lot of parents, and I've heard this, I'm not from St. Joseph originally, but when I moved here and went to Missouri Western, I remember talking to my peers about different agencies in town that I could volunteer or I could do my internship at. And there's a mis, um, misinformation out there that we're a place for bad kids. We are not a place for bad kids. There are no such thing 
as bad kids. There are kids who have had really bad circumstances, and that's something that Mr. Childs, who was a longtime executive director at Noise Home, would say. Um, and certainly, you know, we, we did serve some kids who had some really big struggles um, in the 90s and, and 2000s when I was um, at Missouri Western, but I remember my peers saying, that's where my parents would threaten to take me if I wasn't following the rules. And for a while, I mean, I think I would have gotten involved with Noise Home at a much um, earlier point if I hadn't had that misinformation given to me. So I want you guys to hear loudly, we are not a place for bad kids. There are no such things as bad kids. There are kids who have needs that are being unmet. And that is a thing that Noise Home can help with. But respite care, that was the early respite. Now it looks more like a transitionary program Families who need us, who are homeless, come to us, and then they get their apartment, they get a job. It's maybe not fully furnished. They haven't yet gotten childcare arranged, but so often our families are so eager to get their kids home with them that as soon as they get a place, they move the kids home. And really, a, maybe a little bit longer transition would be helpful for that family. So what we do is ensure that or try to ensure that families who are just reestablishing don't lose that job because they don't have childcare, don't lose that apartment because they've lost their job and end up back at square one when we've been working alongside them for three months to get them reestablished. So we provide up to 30 day respite periods where kids can come to us just similar to, and I hate to use this word because it ends up getting misunderstood, but similar to kind of a daycare type setting in that they come they're, they are there for a period of time and then they get picked up that day. They don't stay 24 hours a day. We do sometimes get phone calls saying, hey, I'm interested in your free daycare program. And we use that as an opportunity to educate them about what respite really is and what our services are intended to be. Um, and then you'll see here, this is behavioral. It was a much larger piece of the pie back in 2011, um, but I don't want you guys to think that these other kiddos here don't have their behavioral challenges. They absolutely do. They've all been through trauma, um, trauma and, and we are working with them and professionals to, to give them the supports that they need. We are just very selective about how, how severe of behavioral placements we will accept, whereas in the past, we, we were more open because we didn't have that younger population we were serving. All right, the next page. I'm hoping that we've motivated you to wanna to get more involved in some way. So how is it that you can help us? Well, first, educate others who may be mis misinformed about who we are and who we serve. Um, I am always amazed at how many people grew up here and they're like, I've driven by this house so many times, but I never had any idea really what went on here when we're you know, giving presentations or tours. Please advocate for kids in our community. If you know of a family right now who's struggling, um, please let them know about our services. We accept pre-placements 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. Um, we have done intakes outside of families' apartments on New Year's Eve. If that's what's needed, we will do it. Um, but pre-placements are necessary and we do have to have the legal guardian be the one who makes them because ultimately they have to be the one to sign them in. Um, really, really, really focus upon the fact that Noise Home is here to help. We are not here to take their children away. Our goal is reunification. Follow us on social media if you don't already, um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We do have an email that blasts that goes out weekly. If you're not a social media person, I get it. I'm not either, um, but there's different ways that we can get you our information. If you're able to donate, and it doesn't necessarily mean monetary, but of course that's, that's what we need. Our community is what keeps our doors open. Maybe you can volunteer your time. Right now, it's not the best time for volunteers in a traditional sense because of COVID restrictions. They are not allowed inside the home yet, um, but we are doing virtual visits. We have um, several groups that come on a Zoom meeting just like this and encourage our kids, maybe present a craft activity or read a book. Um, in-kind gifts is another way, but actually let me back up for a moment. With volunteering, there are opportunities for families to volunteer together. There are opportunities for students. Missouri Western, we often have internship opportunities. Right now we are working on figuring out what that would look like. We're hoping to lift some of our restrictions coming in the spring, summer months, um, but obviously there's, there's much that we need to learn before we can really make that change. Um, 
in-kind gifts are incredibly helpful. It keeps our costs down. And every Thursday we present an emerging need on our social media. Um, and it's things that, you know, you use in your own home, whether it be personal toiletry items or um, Kleenex, disinfectant wipes are a big one, which I know are really hard to find right now. Um, but those are ways that you can help as well. I do have a needs list coming up. Um, and then monetary gifts, of course. I told you that our, um, our funding is it's all private funding. It's all from our community. And our budget is, oh my gosh, we have to raise almost a million dollars every single year in order to hit our fundraising goal. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of um, people making sacrifices and supporting us. But our community has absolutely blessed us since the very beginning. And I each year I'm humbled by the support that we receive. There are ways, um, this is our current needs list, um, I can direct you to our website or our social media if you'd like to look at that more. But there's some basic things. Lice kits are always on there. Um, laundry detergent, always on there. Personal care items, etc. cetera. Um, this is one thing that's relatively new. Within the last few years, we started it. And it's an automatic um, enrollment program where it, you can have a direct debit out of your account to support it. And you are a champion of hope. Um, gifts can be however much you are willing to give. But this is how your dollars help our mission. You know, $100 does, does go a long way. It provides formula for one infant for a month or toiletries for five kids. Um, all the way up here to, you know, $1,000 provides three months supply of milk for up to 40 kids or our gas and heating bill for the month. Um, you know, those, those things that we all are familiar with on a small level in our home. Now just make that times 10 or times 12, you know, to, to be able to function at the level that we do. We have a capacity of 50 children. This is a very new program that we've started within the last two years. Um, we realized quickly um, when I started budgeting the first time as executive director, that we operated kind of on a wish and a prayer and our community always came through for us, but it was nerve wracking in December. We may or may not have enough money to meet our fundraising goal, which means we would have to then cash out investments or we might have to go without. Um, now we approach this as a way to honor our donors um, by creating a hallway. Um, it's actually our stairwell. This is a simulated image, but very similar to what it looks like. We needed to renovate that staircase and we thought that's a perfect place. Um, we found a, a, oh, a quote that said the darkest nights produce the brightest stars. And we then said, help light the way. So we're hopeful that people who are able to give at a $1,500 level or higher We'll consider making that an annual pledged gift, and then we'll honor them with a star on our wall. And it is in a perfect location because it really helps our children to visualize how many people in the community love and support our mission, and also are encouraging of them and what their potential is. So in conclusion, I wanna just remind people what our mission statement is. It's to nurture and empower children, youth, and families to foster a brighter future. And we've added a more recent tagline of healing hearts and reconnecting families, because that is truly in essence what we do each and every day at Noise Home. Are there any questions? I would welcome them. I just have to say right away, um, Chelsea, that was, that was wonderful. I mean, the fascinating history, I've heard bits and pieces since moving to St. Joe, but to hear it put together like that, and um, I can only imagine your project in collecting all those documents and the photos just brings that history to life. And um, just to hear both the, um, some clarification on some things, yeah, that I've heard in the, in the neighborhood about what Noise Home is or isn't. So thank you so much. The, um, the work that is obviously done and the passion and compassion that all of you who are engaged with Noise Home and with Luba have is, is truly inspiring. So thank you so much. Thank you for having the opportunity. Hi. Thank you, Chelsea. This is Janet Croft. I don't know if you can see me, but- um, I can. Here, it was an absolutely wonderful presentation. And I agree with, Anali said it so beautifully. It was just, uh, it inspires me to uh, volunteer there. And it's your presentation was, I've heard presentations before, but yours was just amazing. And I love the pictures and uh, thank you so much for taking your time to do this and to educate us and, uh, and inspire us to, to do more. Well, thank you.
it's our community. I'm truly amazed. I'm not familiar with any other place, really anywhere that's quite like my home and has the level of commitment from the community that they, that we do. And I would just um, add too. lately, I had been looking on the website and I um, have found that very helpful to see the specific needs you know, kind of the daily items that are needed. So tell us again the uh, web address that we can go to, Chelsea. Okay, it's noisehome.org and it'll have a link right there for um, donating now or what our current list of needs are. We are in the process also of updating that website. Um, so if you go there and then you see it's changed, that's that's been planned for a little while. And it's fun to see your beautiful baby. Oh, thank you. So I'm just coming back from maternity leave and I'm working from home a little bit. He's a really good baby, but he did get a little fussy there at the end. So I figured, eh. Well, he's I... a great baby. <laughs> well, thank you. He's very sweet. His name's Henry. <laughs> Hi, Henry. <laughs> all right. Any other questions at all? Chelsea, I would just say I've had um, the opportunity to tour the noise home. The first, um, kind of open house you all had after your renovations and you did the neighborhood block party. Um, my husband and I went. And so for anyone who hasn't had the opportunity to go inside, um, you really do feel the the spirit of, of the good that's done inside of those walls. And so I, hopefully with COVID restrictions lifting, hopefully quick soon, um, folks can get back in and see the wonderful work that's done. It's, it really is heartwarming. Well, thank you for bringing up the block party. It's my most favorite event, sorry, take a seat, that we have every single year. Um, because we do, we throw our doors open for the community and we say, come in for tours. We've expanded it to our backyard and we have a, a we call it a celeb kickball tournament where individuals in our community who advocate for kids are invited to come play against the noise home kids. The game is thrown in favor of the noise home kids. They know they're going to lose from the get-go, but it's a lot of fun. Um, we have good food and, and music. It's just a great time to educate and come together as a community. Um, we also have opportunities for community partners to be present. Now, last year we did not have um, that event, and unfortunately this year we're not planning to either, um, but we will, and we have it 2022. We are going to have our block party, um, our take a seat event. If you haven't ever attended that, I would encourage encourage you to mark your calendars for August 21st. Um, last year, we went virtual for the first time ever. Normally, it's a big party that we have um, to raise awareness and raise funds for Noise Home that's held um, at Civic Arena. And usually, you know, we have 500. I think the most we've ever had is 700. And that's when we raise the bulk of our funds. Um, last year, we had an amazing donor match. So, up to $250,000 dollar for dollar it was matched. I don't know that we'll get to have that same generous gift this year, but we were so grateful to have it last year. It will be online. And as far as I know, there will not be an admission charge. Um, so, you know, please mark your calendars, attend. We had a great program last year, wonderful videos that show resident stories, the success stories. So you get to see, you know, where people, you know, where they started from and, and where they've, they've been able to, what they've been able to achieve. And of course, raise money for Noise Home <laughs> as well. All right. Well, Chelsea and Gretchen, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time and we really appreciate your um, obvious commitment, dedication and uh, inspiring compassion for the kids, the families and really for the St. Joe communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.